Hi, this is the Fiddle Channel. I'm Chris Haig, and I'm going to be talking to you about rock violin, and particularly its heyday back in the 1970s. When it comes to rock music, the violin is hardly the first instrument that springs to mind. In fact, it has to rank right up alongside bluegrass oboe, mariachi banjo, and hip-hop tin whistle as the unlikeliest and most perverse misuse of an instrument. True, violins often appear as part of a string section within the arrangement of a song, but what I consider a rock violinist is someone who is an integral part of the band, able to write his or her own parts and to play improvised rock solos. For a trained classical violinist, the odds are stacked heavily against you when it comes to trying to play rock. The smooth, polished sound of the classical violinist trying to play like Jimmy Page is about as successful as an opera singer imitating Robert Plant. Not least among the problems faced by a potential rock violinist is amplification. Whilst pickups for the violin, such as the Vega and the National Violectric, have been around since the 1930s, they were few in number and relatively poor in quality, and amplifiers were always designed with guitars rather than violins in mind. Nevertheless, by the early 1970s, companies like Barkus Berry were producing good, solid-body violins and piezoelectric pickups for acoustic violins, and many violinists found their way into the British charts, either in mainstream pop or in progressive rock bands. The first violinist that I became aware of in my youth was on the single Jigger Jig by East of Eden, which was a UK hit in 1971. That same year, Arbus also appeared on a song by The Who. It was Barbara O'Reilly, often known as Teenage Wasteland. Forty seconds from the end, out of nowhere, comes an Indian-inspired rock violin solo, which starts low and mellow and leads up to a climactic end of the song. Other unlikely appearances of the violin from the same period include Cause I Love You by glam rockers Slade, which features a violin solo from their bass player Jim Lee, demonstrating with his screeching tone that technology was still very much a challenge. Much sweeter is the sound of Dick Powell's violin solo on Rod Stewart's You Wear It Well from 1972, I'm guessing the fiddle on this was recorded acoustically rather than with a pickup. In the field of commercial pop, the fiddle has always been seen as a bit of a novelty. Cockney Rebel is usually remembered as singer Steve Harley's band, but his co-founder member was violinist John Crocker, who put the fiddle parts on singles including Sebastian, Mr Soft, Judy Teen and their biggest hit, Make Me Smile. The original Cockney Rebel was short-lived, but in subsequent reincarnations of the band, Crocker's place on the fiddle has been taken first by Barry Wickens and most recently by Nick Pinn. Among Nick's other rock adventures has been a long-term association with the crazy world of Arthur Brown. Remember, I am the god of hellfire, my all-time favourite Top of the Pops moment. He also had the bizarre experience of touring with Dublin girl band Bewitched. Every night, his party piece was to be hoisted high above the stage in a metal cage to fight a musical duel with the band's guitarist, similarly suspended on the other side of the stage. The things we do for our art. Violin was often more at home at the progressive end of the pop-rock spectrum, and very few bands were more progressive than King Crimson, led by guitarist and general musical guru Robert Fripp. After a spate of resignations, they were joined in 1972 by violinist David Cross, whose style was initially based on the playing of blues fiddlers Papa John Creech and Sugarcane Harris. Cross's solo on Lark's Tongues in Aspic Part 2 would nowadays have been banned under health and safety, human rights and anti-terror legislation. Even back in the 1970s, this searing, rasping, nerve-shredding solo certainly wouldn't have gone down well at a dinner dance. Also at the far end of the rock spectrum was Magma, a French band founded in 1969 by the drummer Christian Vander. Inspired by Stravinsky and Wagner, this operatic, symphonic, progressive jazz rock band, I'm sure you're familiar with the genre, sang entirely in Kobayan, language from far, far away and deep in the future. Kobaya is, of course, the planet to which mankind will escape when life on Earth becomes intolerable. The music is actually surprisingly accessible, especially on the 1975 live album, which features the French jazz rock violin wizard Didier Lockwood. Another French alien collaboration is Planet Gong, a psychedelic fusion band often featuring Graham Clark on violin. Eddie Jobson carved out one of the most impressive careers in progressive rock. He replaced Daryl Way in Curved Air and went on to work with Roxy Music, Frank Zappa, UK and Jethro Tull. In all of these bands he was best known for his violin playing, but he was also a first-rate keyboard player, greatly increasing his employability. His violin was a clear plexiglass instrument handmade for him by Guy Davis. Another player doubling keyboards and violins with a great CV is Simon House. 
He started off with the Third Ear Band, moving on briefly to Barclay James Harvest and then space rockers Hawkwind, with whom he recorded three albums between 74 and 77. He then worked with David Bowie, appearing on the hit single Boys Keep Swinging in 1980, and later toured with Mike Oldfield on the 10-year anniversary tour of Tubular Bells. So far we've talked almost exclusively about the British rock scene, but in the 1970s there was also a lot happening in the US. Chicago-born violinist Jerry Goodman was one of several jazz-rock fusion violinists around in the early 70s. He joined the flock for their 1970 album Dinosaur Swamps, playing fast, fluent and adventurous solos on songs such as Clown. He was poached from this band by John McLaughlin for his all-star Mahavishnu Orchestra. His first choice had apparently been the French violinist Jean-Luc Ponty, who was unable to get a working visa in time. Though short-lived, this band was a perfect showcase for Goodman. The ten-minute Dance for Mayer, for example, opens with an extended bluesy pizzicato solo and later features an extended violin solo using wah-wah. Ponty finally got his chance with the Mahavishnus in 1974 with the albums Apocalypse and Visions of the Emerald Beyond. Ponty started out as a classical violinist at the Paris Conservatoire before switching to jazz in the late 50s. He soon became one of the most accomplished bebop violinists around. He started working in America in 1967, first with George Duke, then Frank Zappa, with whom he recorded several albums, including King Kong and Electric Connection. By now, Ponty's style had moved a long way from bebop, and using newly developed guitar pedals, such as phaser and flanger, he had a distinctive new sound. From 1975 onwards, he produced a long series of albums under his own name, including Enigmatic Ocean, Cosmic Messenger and Imaginary Voyage. He came up with a whole library of trademark licks, much imitated in future years, not least by myself. If you want to learn some of these, there's a chapter about Ponty in my jazz violin book. John McLaughlin, meanwhile, went on to form Shakti in 1975, calling on the Indian violinist El Shankar. Trained in the Indian classical tradition, El Shankar has a command of his instrument second to none. His astounding technique was too much for a mere four strings, and along with guitar maker Ken Parker, he developed a double-necked, ten-string monster violin, which covers the full range of the string family right down to the double bass. His first solo album, Touch Me There, was produced by Frank Zappa in 1979. Zappa has a good track record for using violinists. The raw and bluesy playing of Don Sugarcane Harris, featured on Burnt Weenie Sandwich, Hot Rats and Weasels Ripped My Flesh. On the latter album, listen to the track directly from my heart to you to hear his trademark harmonica lick and his insistent repetition of short, simple phrases. Sadly, rock violin largely disappeared into the background in the decades following the 70s, but if you know where to look, there's still plenty out there, and nowadays there's lots of great equipment available. There's no better ambassador today for the rock violin than New Yorker Mark Wood, who takes the whole rock persona vibe very seriously. If you want rock guitar hero in violinist form, he is it. With a symphonic rock group Trans-Siberian Orchestra, with six solo albums, and with artists like Celine Dion, Lenny Kravitz, Kanye West and Billy Joel, he gives violin some real rock credibility. He also builds and markets electric violins, notably the Stingray and the V-shaped Viper. If you've enjoyed this, don't forget to hit subscribe. There's a more thorough roundup of rock violinists on my website, fiddlingaround.co.uk. Also, check out my book, Discovering Rock Violin, which tells you all about the techniques of rock improvisation. And sometime soon, I'll be posting an overview of violins in contemporary metal. That's something you won't want to miss. <laughs> <laughs>